Today, with so much going on in Washington, you'd think that President Biden would be at the White House. But no, no, no. Today, President Biden is flying to Alabama to visit a weapons manufacturer, Lockheed Martin, to pressure them to make more weapons faster to send to Ukraine. Here's the tweet from Reuters just a short time ago. President Joe Biden heads to Alabama to visit Lockheed Martin facility that manufactures the anti-tank Javelin missile, putting the spotlight on a weapon that has helped Ukraine fight Russia's invasion. Now, remember a few weeks ago when President Biden is, I keep hitting the wrong button here, so I apologize. You see me yes, doing my studying. Yes. I'm not poking around. I'm looking for supporting evidence that I can bring up. <laughs> as soon as you say something, I'm like, ooh, I wanted to go yeah. ahead. Uh, so remember a few weeks ago? Do you remember a few weeks ago when President Biden told us this? Remember this little soundbite here? The idea. The idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks and trains uh, going in with American pilots and American crews, just understand, and uh, don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III, okay? Okay. I believe you. Thank you. I remember that. I do remember that. So thank you so much for it letting us know. It wasn't a feel-good piece. No, but he was telling Democrats, he's like, I know some of you have been saying this, but the, just remember, remember, this is what's going to happen here. This is World War III. Interesting, right? Well, over the couple of weeks, a big couple of things happened to us over the weekend to bring us 33 billion steps closer to war and World War III. On Sunday, warmonger Congressman Adam Kinzinger, the same guy who a few weeks ago argued for a no-fly zone so we could shoot down Russian aircraft, and then a few days later said he'd be fine with using nuclear weapons. Well, he on Sunday announced a new authorization for use of military force, the AUMF. If passed, the AUMF will allow President Joe Biden to deploy American troops to defend Ukraine if Russia uses chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. Here is this warmonger in his own words. Take a listen. Senator Kane was with us, and he said it is too soon to begin talking about potential use of force in Ukraine. Do you think he's right? No, I don't. I, I don't think we need to be using force in Ukraine right now. I just introduced an AUMF, an authorization for the use of military force, giving the president basically congressional leverage or permission to use it if WMDs, nuclear, biological, or chemical, are used in Ukraine. It doesn't compel the president to do it. It just says if it is used, he has that leverage. It gives him you know, a better flexibility, but also it is a deterrent to Vladimir Putin. If Vladimir Putin wants to escalate with the West, he will. It's easy for him to do it. Uh, and I think right now what we're doing with supplying, with Lynn Lease, with the financing is right. But there may be a point that we have to recognize, you know, look, this is at World War II, prior to World War II, there were moments nobody ever wanted to get involved and eventually came to realize they had to. I hope we don't get to that point here, but we should be ready if we do. Yeah, you really, you really don't hope that we do. You really don't hope. So pushing for a no-fly zone would have basically made that happen. Now you're giving the president the authorization to go ahead at green light to send American troops into Ukraine into battle with Russia. Let that sink in for a moment. Think about his rationale for that. If Russia uses chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, he wants to send American sons and daughters to absorb these chemicals and bullets in a new world war. I mean, there's simply no other way to look at it. Oh, you used chemical weapons or you used a nuclear weapon in this particular region? So there's all kinds of radiation and problems there. Hey, we'll send those kids to a war zone, that a proxy war. For what? Meanwhile, what about all of that money? We're about to shovel another $33 billion to Ukraine. And Kinzinger says both parties are in lockstep. They're working great together right now. It's, isn't it amazing, like the bipartisanship that we have in Washington when it comes to sending money into war zones? Listen. Speaker Pelosi and top Democrats were in Ukraine overnight, as I'm sure you know. Do you see impediments to getting this $33 billion that the president has asked to be passed? I certainly hope not. I mean, look, there's... We do have outliers of people that seem to show some Putin sympathy, but for the most part, Congress is vastly and there's some outliers that so that show some Putin sympathy. So let me get this right. If I don't want to send thirty three billion dollars to kill people, to kill people, I'm a Putin sympathizer, not a humanist. Right. A, no. a Putin sympathizer. So there's no gray area for you. You oh, you piece of shit.
You know, Congress had been floating the idea of enacting the Defense Production Act, which would allow weapons makers to jump into the supply chain in front of other non-weapons companies so that they can take over, say, a semiconductor or, I don't know, metal or whatever it is you need to make bombs, right? Right. Well, just yesterday, in fact, the Department of Defense already started using that to jump in the line for semiconductors. Um, they decided that it says the Department of Defense, this is this is on defense.gov, this is the government saying this, has awarded a $117 million agreement to Global Foundation, Global Foundries, um, to transfer its nanometer, nanometer silicon on insulator semiconductors, right? So even though there is this semiconductor chip shortage for mm -hmm. things that civilians want, um, already the Department of Defense has jumped the line. Even though they haven't actually declared this, they are using it to already jump the line for things that we might want as consumers so that the, it can be used to make bombs. Yeah, you remember how the stories of all the car shortages? So we had like, we couldn't even get used cars in the United States. Like how many of you like were trying to get a car or a used car and you couldn't, or you're paying way more for it because they're just not available? or you couldn't get that computer for your kid to go back to school, or your, you know, your, your, your remote worker, or you have a child that's at home and can't go to school or you know, because of COVID and they need a computer or whatever it is. Oh, don't worry about it. We're gonna make sure that the weapons manufacturers are first in line to get, you know, to make sure that they're getting the money and the production sequencing before you. This yes, is how it is. This for is defense how. aerospace applications, it says. Semiconductors for that, not yeah. for you. Well, so I'd also Kinsey. like to, if, yeah. if I can point out the, this, I mean, they're, they're using this defense authorization, but, but this is not defense because we are not technically at war and right. Ukraine is not a, not a, an official ally. We have no like treaty. So it, I mean, but don't parse <laughs> oh, words, <laughs> Philip. I mean, yes, I know technically we haven't declared war. We're not supposed to pretend that we're actually in war. So this is our proxy war. Again, remember what Adam Schiff said, right? We fight you. We fight the Russians over there, so we don't have to fight them here at home, right? I mean, they're telling us. I right? don't think they agree to that, but we can say those words. Sure. Okay. So here's the rest of Adam Kinzinger. Largely united on the issue of Ukraine, we recognize Ukraine is fighting for all of us. Oh. Uh, that 33 billion is significantly less than what we would have to spend if we took Russia on directly. So uh, I hope we don't have any impediments to that at all. I wouldn't. Have oh, we're getting a deal. He's yeah, we're saying. getting a deal. Pelosi and yeah, like literally, did you, I mean, he just said it all out loud for us right there. I mean, that's exactly what he said. He, it's, it's cheaper. It's on sale, basically. This is like discount war. So it's much less than if we had to go and do what we did in Afghanistan, right? We get to spend way less because they, they're doing it for us. They're cannon fodder for us. They get to take the bullets for us. I, I wish she would have pointed out that no war costs zero dollars, but okay, no, sure. I, you're going to get any pushback from these a-hole anchors? Are you kidding me? Like, any question? Well, I don't know that she's an a-hole, but... Well, we have never seen her ask a tough question of any of these guys on Sundays, on these Sunday shows. So she has an opportunity to ask... A sitting member of Congress who has been pushing for a no-fly zone. Or to point out that anybody who doesn't want to buy bombs is not necessarily a Putin sympathist, but instead a humanist. Yeah, could she, she just... have asked the question, uh, Congressman, you say that those people who are opposed to sending $33 billion to, to Ukraine are Putin sympathizers. Is it possible that some of these members of Congress actually oppose war? and don't want our money going to a war zone and a proxy war led by US and NATO in a country that doesn't belong to us? Is that possible? She could have asked that question, but she didn't. Sure, she didn't. But she's not this show. That's why you all watch this show because that's the kind of question we and would ask them. that's why they don't come on this and show. And that's why they don't come on this show because we will ask them those. We're those not allowed ones. in those rooms exactly. to ask these questions. So yesterday this happened. The United States uh, launched a new round of military exercises in Europe. This is, uh, yes, look at this. The United States and its Western partners have embarked on two simultaneous rounds of war games in Eastern Europe as Russia's invasion of Ukraine enters its third month. Swift Response 2022 is what it's called. Didn't you ever go to, go to that growing up? Like, uh, remember when, like, uh, Pearl Jam headlined Swift Response no. 1993? 
Uh uh-uh. uh. This is a different one than I get. Uh, it's called Swift Response 2022. It's an annual drill hosted by the United States Army's Europe and Africa Component Command. It kicked off yesterday and is set to run until May 20th. It will be carried out across locations in the Arctic High North, the Baltics, and the, ba- and, and the Balkans, and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, the Army statement said. Around 9,000 soldiers, among them 2,700 Americans, 6,300 troops from 16 NATO countries will take part in the exercise. Great. Make no mistake about it, this is not about the Ukrainian people, guys. These politicians don't give a shit about Ukraine. Just like they didn't give a shit about Afghanistan, they don't give a shit about Iraq or Libya or any other place that we invade and destroy. We don't care. All of these warmongers, all they care about is expanding neoliberal power and the military industrial complex. And making money on loans for the weaponry. Yeah, true. I guess that's part of the whole, I mean, you know, it's, it's all part of the big money grab. Although Ninos in the chat says, how's Ukraine going to pay those loans back when Putin will control 80% of the Ukrainian economy? That's a good point. Good question. You know, I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. But who knows? But I'll ask you guys this in the chat. Do you guys believe what Putin says? Maybe you don't. Maybe you think he's a thug. I don't know. Maybe you have no reason to believe what he says. You don't have to believe him. But when they warn NATO about any further meddling in this conflict, they are prepared to use nuclear weapons themselves. We should be concerned. Here's Russia's Sergei Lavrov, Putin's mouthpiece, essentially, describing how they have altered their nuclear response guidelines in Russia. Listen to Sergei Lavrov talk about this. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with a chilling warning. The risk of nuclear war is a real one. Speaking to state-run media, Lavrov said, quote, the danger is serious. It is real. It cannot be underestimated. He added that he did not want to see these risks of nuclear war, quote, artificially inflated. Okay. So well, they've changed their guidelines. Well, saying the words, so... Is that artificially inflated? Those words don't need any inflation. Yeah, I, I don't know. I They're mean, inflammatory enough. And we have this this breaking this afternoon, actually. This was breaking news today. Russian state television warning of underwater nuclear drone strikes on the West. A oh, Russian okay. state news anchor warned that Great Britain could be plunged into the sea by an underwater nuclear strike if it continues supplying weapons to Ukraine. News anchor Dmitry Kislyov, known as Putin's mouthpiece, explained over the weekend the chilling hypothetical scenario of tidal wave producing underwater nuclear attack should the UK continue playing games with Russia over the Ukraine conflict. So let me get this right. Do you guys want to just play with this? Like, is this fun for you? Because that's what Adam Kinzinger is doing. Like literally playing with the threat of nuclear war. Like, hmm, this is something I heard about and read about in the 1940s. You know, I've seen pictures of it. I've seen them using, uh, I've seen them, you know, using those th- thermonuclear weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I've seen them using it on the Bikini Atoll out in the Pacific, you know, testing. It was all kind of fun. Well, as Nicole Pearlroth brings out in her book that a lot of times people who have this inflated sense of power subscribe to this concept of no bus, right? Which is nobody but us. Right. can do these things. And it's extremely naive to feel that way. It's stupid. And we should not feel that way because people will die. And that's sort of no bus type talk. Like, hey, we got some guns. We can do some stuff about it, right? And they're saying, so do we. We can do some stuff about it. So, you know, the only way for that to go well is for nobody to do stuff about it. But we're not doing that. Right. And it's going to continue. And I mean, you don't have to believe them, right? You can say, I don't believe anything they say. Okay. You're like, you're playing with, you're you're playing chicken now, right? So basically what Lavrov is saying, and then what Kislyak is saying, is that even if NATO forces attack anyway, they can and will use nuclear weapons against America and NATO allies. So it doesn't have to be a nuclear attack, that they've changed their guidelines so that it could be, we shoot something of theirs down, doesn't matter. And they could retaliate. Think about what American cities would be destroyed first. Many press reports have pointed out that uh, Russian subs, by the way, um, I had the picture of them here. Maybe I didn't bring it in here. I feel like, should we talk about even say these words? Like, this is is a scary thing. Here's the New York Times. 
Many press reports have pointed to Russian submarines off the coast of the United States. Russian subs patrolling off the east coast of the U.S. A few weeks ago, we had reports off of the west coast of, Ca of California. So these guys are playing with fire. They are telling us what they plan to do right here. In it. They're telling us right in front of our faces. And these warmongers in D.C. are hitting a hornet's nest right now with a stick. So this weekend, Nancy Pelosi in Ukraine met with Zelensky, promised her undying support for anything that he needs. Watch Nancy Pelosi. Anything other than peace, by the way. I didn't hear her talk about peace. We believe that we are visiting you uh, to say thank you uh, for your fight for freedom, that we are on a frontier of freedom, and that your fight is a fight for everyone. And so our commitment is to be there for you until the fight is done. Freedom for not Russian Ukrainians, not, not no, native that, Russian no, Ukrainians. No, no, because if we want to understand how this all started, right, go back to 2014 when the United States installed a puppet government in Ukraine and uh, through the Minsk agreement said, hey, you will leave the eastern Ukrainian separatist regions, the pro-Russian regions alone. And they said, the, in the separatist region, said, well, this, no, this is a puppet regime. Like, this is not our government. This is a coup. We, we're not, this isn't our government. We want our own government. We want our own standards here in these separatist regions in Donetsk and Luhansk. We don't need a, uh, a puppet government set up by the United States. And they violated those Minsk agreements. And here we are. And this is where we, you know. But we pretend that they didn't and that they do stand for. America's values. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, of course. We, we must pretend that in order to continue to make money sending them weapons. Yeah. So Nancy Pelosi, no talk of settlement, no talk of peace. And this ends one of two ways, as, no Ch as Noam Chomsky said. Either President Biden negotiates a peace settlement or Ukraine is totally and utterly destroyed. And by the way, we know exactly how this ends. Just like Afghanistan, just like Iraq just like Yemen, just like any number of other territories that we use as a launching pad for our neoliberal agenda. So they get destroyed. That's what happens. Make no mistake about it. Um, and it's, it's incredibly troubling to see these leaders coming together, flying there when we have all kinds of problems back in the United States. Literally, if you think about the $33 billion that we're spending in Ukraine, and you think about, I posted a video the other day on what it would mean to there's an analysis i think it's by i think it's by the united nations i forget exactly off the top of my head on what it would mean to eliminate poverty in the united states mm -hmm. and it's something around the order of 22 billion dollars 22 billion dollars would eliminate poverty in the united states in one week we're sending 33 billion to ukraine so they can kill other people Right. Think about that for a second. Wrap your heads around that. And then we can all I mean, just go back to our life. I mean, we can circle back around to the argument of like, how about we try and take care of the kids we do have yeah. right now and shelve this abortion talk for a bit, right? Leave that one alone if we're really going to make these kinds of social trade-offs. But right. well, um, I see it, 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 what's interesting to me, and it's just kind of a thought I just had, but, but when, when Russia annexed Crimea, there was a lot of finger wagging going on. Why wasn't this big military push happening? Because we were already in war in Afghanistan. The military industrial complex was fine. They were getting paid. But right. then when Good we pulled point. out yeah. of Afghanistan, there was, we, had no, we had no war. So then right. when basically the same thing as the annexation of Crimea happened, then suddenly we're like, no, we're going to send you everything. I mean, to me, it's, it's just like it's kind of obvious that what they're, what they're doing is like as long as we're in a war, they're fine. They don't really care about these things. But because there was no active war going on, we need somewhere to, put, to sell our weapons. And yeah, then, and, and tax experts were waving the flag about this. Tom Wheelwright, who we like to refer you to often, uh, host of the Wealth Ability podcast, was saying, why is government spending so out of control? This was just last year when we're in peace, right? Pandemic's winding down. We seem to have our handle on what it will cost to vaccinate. Um, but asset prices are going up. The government's printing itself more money. But we're supposedly in peace what are they ramping up for, right? So the economy, the the economics were pointing to this before the politics were. Yes, yeah, and I think also don't forget, you know, don't forget China is the big story here, right? So, you know, we have Russia, we have this sort of middling war before the big one hits, which is going to be the fight over Taiwan and where the United States comes down on that. Um, so, you know, again, this is just like the test ahead of it. 
But I'm telling you, like you're, you're hitting a hornet's nest playing with this idea of nuclear war. Thank you so much for subscribing to our channel. You know, we've been banned, we've been blocked, we've been censored. That's why we started our own website to stay connected with you for free. That's right. So head on over to redacted.inc and make sure you're connected with us. You can sign up again at redacted.inc, not .com.